I think we probably all remember the feeling from when we were children, and the world seemed so big and complicated. There were these governments and other big institutions that ran everything and did everything, and the things that they did were really complicated, and we didn't really have any clue how any of it worked. But because of how complex the systems that they ran were, we just kind of assumed that adults, and especially the adults that were leading society, really knew what they were doing. In my case, I can certainly remember having the feeling that anyone from my immediate family members who were adults, all the way up to the American president, must have really just had things figured out. But as has been remarked by many people, once you start to grow older, you start to realize that no one really knows what they're doing at all. Okay, maybe that's a slight over-exaggeration, but only a bit. Anywhere from your parents, to the figures you respected, to the leaders of institutions and governments, once you get old enough, you start to get the realization that they aren't really as smart as you thought they once were. And things that seemed like a part of some sort of grand plan, more starts to seem as them just bumbling through their life. This thought process is, I believe, a very natural part of growing up. And the overall point of it is just that the world is a lot more complicated than it seems. However, this process, for most people at least, I don't think is ever really completed. Because many, at least many normal people, continue to have a great deal of trust in many leading institutions. We see this very clearly with phrases like follow the science, or listen to the experts, or evidence-based policy. All these sorts of phrases are trying to stir some sort of thought in our brain that policy is as simple as going to some guy in a lab coat who's able to put some swab in a dish and determine what the ideal tax policy is, or what is the best way to run race relations. Okay, obviously that's a straw man, but only a little bit. Anyone that understands the systems with even a cursory level of knowledge would say that it's very complicated, and that there's lots of experts, and they're able to do studies, they're able to analyze things, they have statistics, they have all sorts of useful information. And with this information, eventually they're able to come to scientific or evidence-based conclusions on how best to run society. An apologist would say that certainly these institutions would not have the same level of scientific confidence that the hard sciences would have. But at the very least, these experts, who devote their entire lives to studying policy, have far more knowledge on the topic than any average person that's just sounding off, or some political pundit, whose job is not to actually look at the evidence, but just comment on the news. And on one hand, this argument isn't even totally wrong. But with a bit of investigation, you will quickly find that the so-called experts, the leaders who are in charge of our entire society, are idiots. Now, why in particular am I talking to you about this today? Well, yesterday I saw a tweet from some journalist at all the big newspapers in America. Currently, he works at Bloomberg, but he's also worked at the New York Times and many of the other most prestigious newspapers in the United States. His name is Tim O'Brien, and as far as I'm concerned, he's just one of the many, many, many nameless, faceless journalists that represent all of these major institutions. I've never heard of him before, and I'll probably never hear of him again. I'm sure he sees himself as a valiant truth-teller who is fighting the right-wing menace which controls everything. But the reality is, of course, that he is a leader. He has written for the most prestigious newspapers in not only America, but really the world. And he only really serves as a cardboard cutout for any other journalist, because he is essentially equivalent to any of these other leaders from our ruling institutions. And from just knowing where he works, it's a safe assumption that he went to one of the fanciest universities. He hangs out with all the fanciest people. He goes to the fanciest parties. And certainly, as we've already determined, he works at one of the fanciest newspapers in the world. However, despite all of this, despite all of the education that he has gotten, which should make him an expert in what he does, he is actually an idiot. Because despite all of his power, all of his influence, and all of his fancy education, he doesn't know basic mathematical concepts. He was responding to a tweet about a new batch of ballots that were found in Georgia that had not previously been counted. There were 2,600 ballots, and this was in a more conservative county, so they were expected to break for Trump. The tweet that Tim was responding to said that the ballots had now been counted, 
and there was a net 800 votes for Trump. Now, considering Georgia is a very close race, and by current counts, Joe Biden only won it by a couple thousand votes, this net gain for Trump of 800 is very significant. And I'm sure for most people watching, everything I explained there totally makes sense. So, what's the issue that Tim O'Brien had? Well, he looked at the tweet, and concluded from seeing that there were a net 800 votes for Trump, that that must mean that there were 1,800 votes for Joe Biden, clearly not knowing what the word net means. Now, okay, I don't know, this probably seems really weird. I made this whole video to go over one journalist really messing up on some math in one tweet. You know, who among us hasn't sent out a stupid tweet before? My entire Twitter account is basically just me sending out stupid tweets. But there's a difference. I'm just some moron on the internet. Tim, on the other hand, he's not just some dude on the internet. He has the saintly blue check mark. He went to a good school. He works at the best newspapers. And there are many people who believe that all of that still means something. There are many people who still look at journalists the same way I looked at my mom when I was six. They figure that they must have all this information, that they must really have these things figured out. But every once in a while, we can see just how clearly the glass breaks. How actually, these geniuses fail to grasp even simple concepts. This is, of course, just one of many examples of this. I'm sure we've all seen many, many others. One example in particular that's always really stuck out in my mind is I remember reading a journal article once in university, and the author said that in 1900, the UK had a very high infant mortality rate. That is, she didn't say it had a high infant mortality rate compared to today, she said it had a very high infant mortality rate for the time. And the way that she proved that was by comparing the infant mortality rate from 1900 to today. This seemed like self-evidently a bafflingly stupid way of comparing statistics. But even when I brought it up to my professor and said that I thought it seemed kind of weird, I could tell my professor clearly had no clue what I was talking about. So there you have at least two PhDs who spent at least 11 years getting their education, and many more years doing further study, that don't even understand the most basic elements of how to compare statistics. And as I've already said, it's not that weird that people don't understand some pretty basic concepts like these things. What's weird is that these are the exact people that we are told are the official sources. These are the people that make the narrative. These are the people who are told to have trust in, to call things correctly. This is the priestly class, though they are the priestly class of science, who, unlike the former barbaric priestly classes, these people have real evidence to prove their religion. Or, at least, of course, that's what we're told. But we see very frequently that these big brain elites aren't as big brain as they portray themselves to be. There's, of course, also the ongoing replication crisis within social science. That is, that many of these social science studies that are the evidence for the evidence-based policies cannot even replicate the findings that they purport to show. But there's actually a much greater problem with this whole idea, with the concept of scientific governance or evidence-based policy. The real problem with it is that scientific government can't exist. Most of the criticisms I've made thus far are just implying that it's not working well. But the real problem is that it can't work well. The reason it's not working well is just a symptom that shows that fact. Governance is principally an artistic, philosophical, and religious concept. And the values that go into determining how government should be run are primarily based on those fields, not on science. We see this a lot, especially with the current world crisis, with a lot of people saying that we just need to follow the science. We need to just do what the science says. Science is not a policy. Science can be used to help craft policy, but it cannot be used to determine how we should be governed and what policies we should enact. As Edmund Burke said, the age of chivalry is gone, that of sophists, economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. Thanks for watching, please donate to my subscribe star if you enjoy this content, and please remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and share these videos with anyone who you think will enjoy them. And a special thanks to my donors, Emmett Vestry, yourself, Cepheus Rex, Lita, Quo Pregranator, Haxorius, Adzutko, Josiah, King of Evil Florida and the Moon, 
Seth Apex, Richard, Cringewalker, Zian Harris, Thomas Thomist, Windowlick, and Augustine. Thank you everyone again for watching, and goodbye.